Happy Earth Day. My name is Becky LeBoy. I'm the Education Outreach Specialist with Ocean County Soil Conservation District. Welcome. I'm going to share with you a few opening remarks. Welcome to our 23rd annual Barnegat Bay Environmental Educators Roundtable. Thank you for joining us online today. This year's roundtable is dedicated to our dear friend and mentor, Miss Lois Sheck. And I'm going to share a little uh, picture. So please stand by. Ms. Lois Sheck, who passed away in early March. Lois attended every roundtable event since its inception in 1997. She was a dedicated educator for over 40 years. She was a mentor, a friend, and she was even my fifth grade teacher. Lois was a pioneer of environmental education and her legacy will live on through our own actions and our own teachings as we continue to inspire our youth and our community members to be stewards of the Barnegat Bay watershed and of the earth. May the forest be with you, Lois. Our annual Environmental Educators Roundtable typically takes place at the Lighthouse Center for Natural Resource Education in Waretown. Although this year we will deeply miss the camaraderie and the fun that we have gathering together, sharing a meal, engaging in hands-on outdoor activities. We are grateful to be able to connect with you today online to share this teaching and learning experience and celebrate this special day, Earth Day. Together with our many talented partners, Ocean County Soil Conservation District has put together a suite of programs, including lessons, activities, videos, a podcast, and this webinar. Please log on to our website, www.soildistrict.org forward slash educational hyphen programs forward slash roundtable to explore, engage, and enjoy these programs. And we will also share a link on our webpage to this recorded webinar. The theme for our Environmental Educators Roundtable this year is Happy Earth Day for the Next Generation, Full Steam Ahead. This theme underscores the importance of our planet Earth for the next generation. We owe it to them to protect our planet so they can live a happy and healthy life. The lessons and activities we have assembled for you focus on this theme. Many are aligned with the next generation science standards for teachers and students, and they also include STEAM-based activities, which teachers know stands for science, technology, engineering, art, and math. We are thrilled that this year's roundtable keynote speaker, Kelly Gill, is here with us today to share her program about pollinators. Pollinators are true heroes of the earth. Kelly is the Senior Pollinator Conservation Specialist for the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation and a partner biologist with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service in the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast region. She provides technical support to NRCS and to landowners for implementing the farm bill practices to conserve pollinators and beneficial insects. This technical support includes planning and installing pollinator habitat on farms, community and urban gardens and in natural areas. Kelly also works with agency staff and research partners on the de development of technical guidelines, outreach materials and training programs to guide pollinator conservation efforts. Kelly has a master's degree in entomology and wide ranging experience in habitat restoration for pollinators and other wildlife. You can learn more at the Xerces website and that's spelled X-E-R-C-E-S dot org. Thank you so much, Kelly, for sharing your time and expertise with us. 
Thank you very much for that introduction. I cannot think of a better way to spend Earth Day than with a group of environmentalists that are devoting their time to educating our future scientists and nature lovers. So it is my pleasure to be here. Uh, I too wish it was in person, of course, um, but I'm glad we have this option and I appreciate all the attendees joining virtually. Hopefully someday in the future we can do something in person soon. I'm going just to click here uh, to switch screens and then I'll get a confirmation from Becky. You could see that. Yes. Fantastic. Um, so happy Earth Week, everybody. I am, uh, again, so pleasured to be here today. I'm going to jump right in. Um, I like to say my thank yous first because I get really excited talking about pollinators and other insects and often forget at the end. So thank you, Becky, for setting this up and being versatile, <laughs> moving into the virtual format. Um, again, to all the environmental educators, to Xerces Society members, supporters, and donors, and USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. They make our work possible. And I'll explain just a little bit about what the Xerces Society does. Um, our mission is, um, well, we're an invertebrate conservation group, we're a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to protect wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitats. Um, and I'm sure you being all environmental educators, you know there's a lot of connections in our environment. It's, it's this system-based learning um, and, and habitat work that we really pride ourselves on. Um, secondly, we're a science-based conservation organization. You heard Becky say that we work a lot with research partners. Um, there is a lot of information, a lot of advocates for pollinators these days. I'm happy to um, see the interest growing and the concern growing. Um, one thing I think that sets Cersei Society apart is that we are working with land-grant uh, universities and other scientists and researchers to, to do field tests, to do research. So anything you see online or any of our programs or materials are really deeply steeped in science and, and we do pride ourselves on that. We work with diverse partners. Uh, our staff is very diverse with a lot of specialty areas um, and, and most of our work is with land managers, educators, policymakers, farmers, and, and citizens. Um, so we have a really broad group of stakeholders um, we are named after this butterfly you see here. This is the Xerces blue butterfly. This was a species that occurred on the west coast um, in the San Francisco Bay area. And as that area got developed, um, the habitat that this particular species was tied to was removed from the landscape. Um, and, and so that caused, unfortunately, this species to go extinct. So we no longer see this species in real life, but it is our namesake to remind ourselves that even the smallest species need um, conservation. The Xerces Society does a lot of different things and we have a lot of program areas. I do encourage you to go online and visit our website to learn more. Um, a couple examples are pollinators. We have an agro, uh, agricultural biodiversity team. We work with conservation biocontrol, endangered species, aquatic invertebrates, pesticide protection, urban conservation. We have programs for communities and certification programs for farms. Please check that out. It's just way too much to go over today. Um, and I do want to highlight some of our Earth Week programs. Since it is Earth Week, um, it's only Wednesday, so we'll be celebrating for the rest of the week. I thought maybe you would want to check out our other webinars that are um, archived online. These include a classroom series, uh, programs for youth, community science programs you can get involved in, uh, lots of information on gardening and habitat um, restoration, and again, just a, a whole suite of different species, different very important species are covered here. So please go see these featured videos, check out our YouTube channel, subscribe. There are so many great resources there. 
And we also have region specific resources. So we'll talk today about habitat and gardening for pollinators. Um, and if you need more information, you could go to our website. We have a pollinator conservation resource center. Um, it's shown by this map here. So I'm in New Jersey. I think a lot of people are joining from New Jersey today. You can click on New Jersey and get region specific resources. Um, if you wanna send stuff to your friends in California or Minnesota, or Florida, check on those regions of the map and you can get plant lists um, and other habitat restoration resources along with all of these more general uh, publications. It's just a humongous library of resources. If you're looking for something specific, it's so extensive. If you can't find anything, just reach out to me. I'll be happy to send you um, information. All right, so Enough with the introductory material, let's get right down to it. Um, I know I don't have to convince all of you that insects are super interesting, fascinating creatures. Um, they're the most diverse species group, or the most diverse group of animals with over a million described species and counting. Only a very tiny fraction of insect species are uh, economically important pests. So I know a lot of people um, <laughs> maybe have a bad perception of insects or certain insects, but please know that's a very, very small proportion that, that are pests or nuisance pests. They're very important for sustaining the abundance, diversity, um, and biomass of insects and bio. Um, biodiversity in general, and this is healthy, uh, essential for healthy ecosystems. Sorry. Uh, if you look at this pictogram here, this is just an image uh, where the size of the organism pictured depicts the proportion of diversity that organism represents. And so you can see here that insects are uh, represented by this big beetle. Beetles are within insects, beetles are the most diverse group. And you can tell just by the proportion of species in that group that there's many, many, many more species and much more diversity than trees and fish and birds even combined. So very critical for our systems in general. A lot of people ask me why they should love insects, and this is an endless answer. I could go on. Uh, here are a couple examples that I like to bring to the table. Um, invertebrates in general, including insects like this dung beetle you see in the upper corner here, are uh, decomposers. So things like flies and beetles and many other insects play a really critical role in role in decomposing over 90% of human and animal waste. Not the sexiest job, but I think one of the most important, right? The recreation industry, this is an indirect link, but as we see, you know, people watching birds going out and looking for butterflies, enjoying nature and buying all that gear that goes along with fishing and hunting, you know, our, our insects are really the base of the food chain for a lot of those animals. And we wouldn't have wildlife recreation without insects supporting that, that pyramid. Of course, we're here today to talk about pollination. We'll go into that in depth. But we also have insects that provide pest control. Um, I like to use this example in this wonderful photo at the bottom to tell you all that not all stink bugs are bad. Some good stink bugs eat the bad stink bug pests that we're used to complaining about. So there's always exceptions in the insect world. There's never, you know, one uh, basket that we can put all of these species in or these species groups in. And I hope we can learn about that a little more today. We're going to focus on pollinators, but I wanted to give that general overview to begin with. Of course, we know pollinators are uh, very, very important for our flowering plants. More than 85% of our flowering plants require an animal. In the temperate region, most of the time that animal is an insect, and most of the time that insect is a bee, to move pollen, right? Plants can't get up and go out on a date, so a lot of these uh, flowering plants need a third party to help move that genetic uh, material from the male part of the plant to the female part of the plant for pollination and fertilization. 
And we need a diverse pollinator community to do this. Um, and so we're gonna take a look at that today in some examples. And this is really critical for su sustaining our natural areas, as well as uh, productive agricultural lands. So pollinators are what we call an ecological keystone. Um, so I'll, an analogy that we use a lot is the game of Jenga here. You know, we don't, if you remove that foundation, the system collapses. And I'm sure you're familiar with this. Um, but this is one of the links we were talking about earlier about the conservation of wildlife through the protection of invertebrates, this bigger picture that we're talking about. So the pollination of our wild plants results in fruits and seeds that are a major part of diets for birds and mammals, other wildlife. Um, you know, we put pollinator habitat on the ground, but it attracts a lot of other beneficial insects. Um, and some of these insects are food for birds. So we know, you know, a lot of our land birds, most of them I should say, rely on insect protein as part of their diet. And then pollinator habitat is compatible with the needs of other wildlife. Um, I hope that's obvious. I will try to mention um, those connections and, and some of those benefits as we go through today. And then humans. Um, this this uh, photograph has been circulating for a little while, but I put it in because I think this is a lot what, you know, from the human perspective, a lot of what we think of pollinators as, right? Important for our food supply and human nutrition. And so this is a picture that Whole Foods Market took. This could be your produce uh, section in any market, your CSA basket, your farmer's market, wherever you're used to going to get all those nutritionally dense, uh, vitamin-rich foods that we use in our recipes. And you can see we're used to having this big, bright, colorful aisle of options. What Whole Foods did here in their Share, Share the Buzz campaign is took all of the pollinator dependent products just out of the produce aisle. So this doesn't even capture things that fruits are added to like juices and yogurts and things like almond milk and dairy products. And so this is what it looked af like afterwards. So we wouldn't starve to death necessarily. Um, we'd have to rewrite some cookbooks, cooking without pollinators perhaps. Um, but in this instance, about 237 of 453 products, about 50% of the produce items were removed. And these are items that are directly dependent on pollinators. So that plant has to be pollinated to produce a fruit or that particular crop produces bigger, better, larger, more shapely, more ripe fruit when it is pollinated by insects. So moving on, um, there's plenty of other reasons that uh, make pollinators very, very important. Um, you could look at some of our materials online to get more examples. And if you're looking for examples for certain crops, please let me know. Um, but really what I want to get into today is the pollinator conservation basics. And I think this really aligns well with STEM or STEAM learning um, because we're using a lot of, of, of science here, right? We're using biology, botany, entomology, ecology. Um, we're, when it comes to planting habitat or gardens, we're using technology tools um, for our larger habitat projects. We use mapping, GIS, um, you, you know, landscape architecture and planning applications, measurements, metrics, observations, data collection. The list goes on and on and on. But if we really want to do a good job um, conserving pollinators, we really need to understand what they need. And I'm going to be talking here about native bees um, as the example. Um, so first, oops, first of all, we need to know how to recognize our native bees or pollinators in general. We can't do conservation if we don't know what these animals look like. And that is um, a challenge in the insect world compared to other wildlife conservation of, of big charismatic megafauna. Fauna. 
because these animals are small and a lot of times they're very cryptic and hard to find and hard to identify especially when they're moving around amongst a bunch of plants um, so that's very important and it can be very time consuming to learn all of that taxonomy so we're going to generalize today and we're just going to look at the diversity of native bees as kind of a, a, a start a, a jumping off point uh, the importance of diverse pollinator populations, you know, we need redundancy in the system. We can't just rely on one bees or managed bees. We need all these different pollinators because they act differently. They interact with flowers and plants differently. Um, and some of them have a lot of very specialist relationships. One very important thing is that we need to target our efforts to, um, you know, plan these whether it's a pollinator garden or large scale habitat restoration, we really need to think about the life cycle of these animals, right? We have to support them throughout their entire life cycle. So a very common response is planting flowers. Of course, that is important. These animals need to eat and they're feeding on nectar and, and or pollen or both. But we also have to think of where they live, how they nest, uh, reproduction sites, winter cover, you know, some of those things we aren't considering. Um, so I, I like to make the cheesy joke, we just can't be a flower weather friend. So plants require a diversity of pollinators for effective and sustainable pollination. And you may ask, well, what is a pollinator? I know uh, something my husband is always asking is, is that a good one or a bad one? As he points to an insect on a plant. And I still try to tell him they're all good, right? Uh, they all have some role to play. So uh, when we talk about some of these insects like butterflies and moths. You know, they're feeding on nectar and plants in their adult stage. We're all very familiar about with metamorphosis. So in that larval or caterpillar stage, they're herbivores, so they switch their diet. The same with flies and beetles. Um, you know, flies and beetles are very, very, very diverse groups of insects. They feed on a range of things depending on the species in their grub or larval stage. Um, but as adults, some of them feed on flowers. Same with wasps. Now, bees are relatives of solitary wasps, a group of solitary wasps um, that have a very unique life uh, lifestyle or, or habit of um, provisioning, of nest provisioning, which is rare in the insect world. So an adult female wasp will provision her nest with live prey. So if you think of something like a cicada killer going up into a tree, grabbing a cicada, bringing it down into her underground burrow, laying an egg on that, as that egg goes through developmental stages, it feeds on that you know, fresh meat. Bees evolve to do things a little differently. Uh, they're very similar to wasps in that they provision their nest, but they're vegetarians throughout their entire life. So compared to some of these other insects, they're out there collecting mass amounts of pollen. And that means they're moving pollen around a little bit more, um, especially in our region of the world. So here you see this beautiful bumblebee, um, the teddy bear of the insect world, as, as many people like to say, and one of my favorite animals uh, or groups of animals. And she's covered in squash pollen. And so I'm sure you can tell from what you picture as a wasp that's not very hairy, doesn't have these structures on its body to collect pollen readily. And the same could be said for a lot of flies and, and butterflies as well. But in that process of becoming, you know, vegetarian flower feeder, to be good at that over time, bees evolved really cool structures, things like um, these fluffy branch hairs uh, that have a little bit of an electromagnetic charge. Um, so you could think of them as a Swiffer duster for flowers. Um, they land on a flower and that little bit of charge <laughs> suctions that pollen to their hairs and then those branches within those hairs um, that you can't see from this picture, but maybe you saw some of the slideshow earlier of those very uh, uh, close-ups, that hair is highly branched and holds that pollen in. And they have um, 
structures on their legs, pollen baskets or hairy legs that called a scopa that help them bring a lot of pollen back to the nest. They're hardwired to collect pollen and raise the next generation. That is the whole goal here. And so the more pollen they can get back to the nest, the better, uh, the better off they are. So just to review that, uh, in our region, bees are kind of the extraordinary pollinator. pollinator. They actively collect and transport that pollen to provision their nest. They exhibit um, a behavior called flower constancy or flower fidelity, um, which just means if you have a big blooming, let's use apple orchards right now, they're about to go into bloom. If you have a big blooming apple orchard, a bee could land on a flower, learn how to work it, access that pollen, that nectar, those resources, and then as it visits the next apple flower, it learns and it could get faster as collecting those resources. So it's the typical, um, you know, uh, story of foraging efficiency. Much more efficient to go from flower to flower to flower on the same tree, then from flower to dandelion to something blooming over here. Um, that'd be the equivalent of us going to, you know, a, a different supermarket or floral market for all of our um, groceries. And they forage in and around their nest. They're central place foragers. So when we talk about habitat, we're going to look a lot at nesting. So, they're nearly, oops, going back to being able to uh, identify pollinators, there's nearly 3,600 species of native bees in the U.S. Now, unfortunately, it would take a very long time for us to go through them all, <laughs> and I'm sure at some point you want to get done with this today. So we're just going to just look and observe and get used to um, all these different colors and types of bees. Um, I know a lot of people think of bees, they picture a honeybee, you know, that kind of amber and black torpedo shaped bee. But we have bees that are very, very tiny, just a couple millimeters long. And, uh, you know, this, this poor lady's kind of drab, not a lot of showy colors, but look at all that pollen she's carrying. We have big fuzzy bumblebees I think most people are familiar with. We have these shiny, beautiful green bees, um, sh very stripy bees, very fuzzy bees with long antenna that aren't honeybees, these long horned bees. Um, you could get, you could see a profile of all of these insects online or in our book, Attracting Native Pollinators. It is really, really dynamic, the diversity that's out there um, and the different morphologies and characteristics these species have just visually. So they come in a variety of shapes and sizes, which makes sense. You know, we have all of these different flower shapes and sizes, and some bees are a good fit while some others aren't. So just to demonstrate that, you see here again this green bee. You see some of our smaller bees. This is a, um, a dark, what we call a dark sweat bee, a green sweat bee over here, a dark sweat bee. This is a small carpenter bee and a bumblebee. Over here, this picture I think really demonstrates that diversity of size. In the background, you could see, excuse me, this large bee head. This is our um, large carpenter bee. That's the buzzy guy that's kind of um, uh, a little territorial around nests and, and people tend to not like where those nests are placed because usually it's in structures, uh, human-made structures like decks and things like that. Um, the buzzy bee are, that's guarding that nest entrance is a male and males don't sting. Male bees don't sting. So if you see that bee with a nice um, white face, a carpenter bee, you could grab them, pet them, impress your friends. Um, it's one of the largest uh, car, uh, bees we have here in our area and you can see this small bee, Perdita minima, sitting on its head. So this is an eye. This is an antennae here and the ocelli. So a wide, wide range of size. And, and you can see that, you know, that makes some of these organisms very hard to study. And there's some that we don't know a lot about at all. In fact, we have um, only a good amount of data on a, a very few species or groups. So we're, we're constantly using our citizen science programs and other methods to collect more data. So we have those historical records. All right. 
To recap that, um, we need our diverse pollinator populations, not just for you know, the, the benefits and the economic benefits they bring to agriculture and humans and the, the wider um, ecosystem, but just to protect, it's our job to protect the intrinsic value of nature and biodiversity. Plants need best match pollinators. Some pollinators are generalists and visit a huge diversity of plants. Some, some pollinators are specialists and they specialize on the pollen, meaning their young can't develop on a wide range of pollen. They collect pollen from a certain group or species of plants, right? So we have some of those specialists. There's different behaviors. We won't get into all of them today, but one example is buzz pollination, which is um, a, uh, I think bumblebees are the most well known for having this behavior, but they vibrate their wing muscles at a certain frequency as they grab onto a flower. And this is really important for flowers like tomato, eggplant, blueberry, where the pollen is held captive in, in what they call a porocytal anther. So that anther, uh, that pollen isn't widely available by just landing on the flower alone. That flower needs to be buzzed at a certain frequency. It's a mid C note. Um, it's the hey and hey Jude, if anybody wants a reference for that. And that is the exact right frequency needed to shake that anther like a salt shaker and have that um, uh, pollen rain out on a bee. Bumblebees are very good at it because they're big and robust, but some of our other native bees can do it as well. Um, our, native, our native bees are active in conditions that are prohibitive to honeybee foraging. So on days like today or early spring days when it's rainy and kind of cooler, our native bees like bumblebees or some of our digger bees and early spring bees are more tolerant of that and will continue to forage and pollinate. Well, honeybees are more like me. They like to hunker down till it's 70 and warm and uh, sunny out. So those, those bees kind of have a, a specialty in time, this temporal synchronization, right? When we look at pollinator diversity and crops, there's so many examples I'd love to share with you, um, but this study summarized things very nicely, looking at 41 crops around the globe. Uh, the researchers found that wild pollinators provided better quality pollination than compared to honeybees alone, and they set fruit at twice the rate of honeybees. So they're interacting with the flowers differently through cross-pollination, buzz pollination, and other behaviors. Uh, this is not to say that we don't need honeybees. Um, they're important in our agricultural systems, especially those large monocultures where uh, habitat has been removed and there's not a source of native bees. But um, we really want to focus on having that diverse community. And this study found that, you know, even when honeybees were brought to these farms, they weren't a substitute for the entire pollinator community, which is a really important concept when we think about diversity and conservation and why pollinator conservation is important. Our um, wild plants or native plants also are really reliant on pollinators. So about 30% of our bee species in the mid-Atlantic and Northeast are pollen specialists. I mentioned this earlier. Some of the uh, plants they specialize on are pictured here, this Claytonia um, and willow. Other examples are dogwood, sunflower, goldenrod, hibiscus, and more. So those particular bees that are specialists can't go to other plants and forage for pollen to raise their young. They might nectar on other plants as, as adults, but they really rely on the pollen of these plants for their development. Just checking the time here. Um, I think the status of pollinators is, is well known, particularly to this group. I'm just going to go through these quickly. Um, of course, habitat loss is one of the major threats. The conversion of open space, the conversion of farmland to developed lands, the loss of that open green space, loss of natural areas, and loss of even marginal land for agriculture. You know, those field borders and fence rows that once maybe um, had some flowering weeds 
weeds or shrubs in there in those edges have been pushed out of the landscape as we expand um, our agricultural fields fence post to fence post. Uh, pesticide use, of course, is, is um, well known as a contributor to these declines. This can be uh, mosquito control. This could be agricultural chemicals. Uh, believe it or not, more uh, insecticides are used in home and garden use than agricultural lands. So even our own landscapes, um, you know, our neighborhoods and yards can pose a threat, depending on how you're managing them. Um, Disease is a problem. These animals get sick. Um, uh, things that spread disease are commercial or captive rearing, which is unregulated. Uh, there's, there's no uh, regulation on the sanitary conditions for some of those companies that rear things like bumblebees or um, to order butterflies or beneficial insects. So they often come um, uh, to their destination with disease or unfortunately maybe already dead. <laughs> um, so that's a way to spread disease to the these wild counterparts that are living out in nature. Uh, invasive species, so our introduced plants are, you know, degrading our native plant communities, pushing those plants to the edges, and a lot of times reducing the amount of, of uh, floral resources that are available throughout this season as we get these big colonies of invasive species like knotweed and knapweed. Competition, um, honeybees can be really good at stripping resources especially if you bring a large number of hives into an area with very little flowering habitat. So that doesn't leave much left for some of the wild pollinators. And then changing climate, altering habitat, synchroni synchronization with resources, uh, range uh, retraction. And so there's a lot of unknowns in that area. And we're, we're looking very closely into ways to build these habitats to be more resilient to those climate change projections. Okay, so just some of the species we know a little bit more about, uh, bumblebees being one of them, presumably um, because they're bigger and easier to study, and we have a lot more historical records of what their populations look like in the past. So we can, we can make, um, we could analyze that data and be able to say, you know, how much these animals are declining or what's happening with their populations versus some other species where we don't know, we don't have historical records, so we don't know um, what their current status is. Bumblebees are a group we know a little bit more about. Uh, Xerces has done a lot of work on our endangered species team with Rich Hatfield and Serena Jepson on looking into bumblebee decline. We found that at least a quarter, more than a quarter of our bumblebees in, the, in Canada and the US are threatened. And so um, this pie here just shows that the number of species and then all of these areas from red to yellow mean they're in pretty bad shape. They're either critically endangered, vulnerable, or near threatened. Uh, we have some species that don't seem to be causing any concern right now. Uh, we're monitoring, monitoring those populations, and then some species we just don't have enough data on. Butterflies, the same. I know we've heard a lot of uh, news about monarch butterflies. We have over 800 species in North America and uh, north of Mexico, and the Nature Serve assessments on these animals found that 141 species are at risk, which is greater than 17% of all, all of our North American butterflies. Probably the most concerning because people are familiar with the monarch, they're such an iconic species, and not too long ago, you know, in the 90s only, hundreds of millions of monarchs made the epic flight to Mexico um, or their overwintering sites on the California coast, depending on if they were in the east or western population of monarchs. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of times, I think some people think, oh, that species, you know, for a rare species, like the Xerxes blue butterfly or a specialist that's tied to very unique habitat, we may think, oh, that was pretty rare. You know, 
no wonder it declined. But when we're looking at something so widespread and that was just a numerous population not too long ago, it kind of raises a concern. So we've seen numbers fluctuate throughout the years, but they're much, much lower. Um, these data are taken at the overwintering sites where it's easy to count them each winter. And you can see, you know, we're still on the very low end. This is 2019 to 20. Um, the total area was only 2.83 hectares um, compared to what they think would be uh, a stable population goal of six hectares. And that even is low. Um, so we still have work to do on monarch declines. All right. Transitioning a little bit here, this is where we start talking about um, how these bees live, right? And I like to use honeybees as an example because we're familiar with them. We're from, we picture these bees as social animals with a caste system and queen and workers and drones um, and cooperative care, living in a man-made hive that we can move around. Uh, you know, the honeybees produce honey. That's very, very rare. Lucky for us that they do. I love honey, um, but that's not a typical behavior in the bee world. Um, that's very unique to honeybees. And then having these colonies that are able to be managed. There's very few bees. There's one species of bumblebees and then some other solitary bees where we can uh, sort of manage them. Um, but that's not the goal here. The goal is to create this habitat that makes it favorable for them to survive and thrive. So although honeybees are likely a, a very familiar species to most of us, they are almost the um, exception to every rule when it comes to bees. <laughs> so not the best model. Um, we, when we talk about our native bees, we divide them into some general groups based on how they nest. Um, so we have social nesting species like bumblebees. They are similar to honeybees in that they have a queen and workers, but they only have an annual colony. So their colony is founded every year by a new queen that has overwintered from the previous season. The rest of the colony dies, unlike uh, honeybees who are perennial and they overwinter with that queen. The vast, vast majority of our uh, native bees are solitary. They don't have a queen. Um, the nest is built, provisioned uh, by a single female. And most of these bees are nesting in the ground, as you can see here in this center photo here, about 70% of our native species. The other 30% are uh, stem or wood nesting species. So you could see here, this is a hollow twig. Um, our stem nesters will nest in hollow twigs. They may excavate the soft pith from um, a stem and use that. And some of them nest in woods, things such as snags where there might have been some beetle damage, beetles that already bored holes in the wood, um, or just soft um, downed wood. And we'll look at pictures of that um, in a little bit here. But the, the main takeaway here is these bees do not live like honeybees. So we can't um, assume that if we do something good for honeybees, it's gonna help all the bees. And this is where it really comes down to, like I mentioned earlier, knowing um, the different life cycles just in general and how these bees live. So for our bumblebees, again, these are the, I'm gonna go through a little detail on each of these and then we'll move on to habitat, um, which is my favorite part. Uh, so the bumblebees are social nesting. They usually adopt an insulated cavity above or below ground, and they have these annual colonies founded by a single queen. Their nests are much smaller than honeybees. So picture 25 to 400 workers, and if a bumblebee nest did have 400 workers, that would be stupendous. It's usually much lower um, on that range. Um, these nest sites include things like underground cavities, maybe an old rodent burrow that's been abandoned, overgrown areas, um, in particular bunch grasses that have that big, like that tussock or that uh, very 
a dense base, things like little blue stem and big blue stem and switchgrass, uh, those grasses tend to lodge a little bit and bees will go into those cavities at the base and build a nest, bumblebees I should say. Tree cavities, hollow logs, rock piles and walls, any of these insulated cavities. And this does vary by species. So some species may have a, a more of a preference over another for one, one of these different nest site types. Um, but here's what that bumblebee life cycle looks like. So right about now this hibernating queen, she's mated. So she spent all winter underground um, hibernating. She'll emerge in the spring. And she'll, you'll see around this time of year, be scanning for a nest, looking low to the ground. At this point, this bumblebee queen's acting similar to a honeybee, uh, or similar to a solitary bee. I'm sorry, I misspoke there. She's building the nest. She's building these little waxen pots out of glandular secretions and uh, filling them with, just with a little bit of honey, not enough for us, uh, but enough for the colony. And then in the summer, that colony peaks, that first brood emerges and she gets workers to go out and do all the work. And she kind of switches to acting more like a honeybee queen at this point. She stays in the nest and lays eggs. Um, in the fall, males leave the nest. There's a round of reproductive workers produced. They mate, that's what produces this queen that overwinters and that starts all over again. We have tons of bumblebee information on our website if you're looking for more examples. For our ground nesting bees, they're usually um, in these tunnels that they've excavated. These tunnels can be different configurations with different types of branching. Some of them are um, lined with, again, some kind of waxy secretions for water protection. But you can see here, these pollen balls, and here's a blown up picture up top. This is that pollen that that bee has collected, built this nest, put that pollen ball in there, laid an egg on it, and you see that um, larva emerging here that will go through developmental stages, pupate, and emerge typically the next year, right? So unlike honeybees, these bees, most, most of our um, native bees don't have multiple generations per year. Some do, and there's some variation, um, but most don't. And they look like ant holes from above. Here you can see a cute bee poking out our head there. And this is the time to look for some of our early spring bees because, because they're becoming active. Um, you may see, oops, spiraling out of control there. You may see several nest sites next to each other like this. These are not wasps in the early spring. They're bees. Um, they're not a colony. It's a neighborhood of unrelated females, but it's a good nesting habitat. So you may see them aggregating in these areas. Um, a lot of times this is things like parks, uh, baseball fields, soccer fields, where there's a lot of foot traffic and more bare spots on the soil. Um, but bare spot, spots aren't the only place they'll build nests. They will, uh, they can be found in turf. They might move mulch over. So pretty opportunistic. Usually you can find them more easily on south facing slopes that warm up kind of early in the morning. Our stem or wood nesting bees comprise nearly 30% of the native bees. And here you can see a cross section of what that looks like. This is what I was referring to earlier, where they'll lay a series of um, eggs in these chambers they make in this uh, stem. Those chambers or little nurseries are often divided by um, uh, other plant materials. So not only will they collect pollen and lay eggs, but some of our stem or wood nesting bees will collect mud and section off those little nurseries. So each developing bee gets its own food supply. And here you can see a little bee butt hanging out there. Um, so our alfalfa, so the mason bees are the ones that are collecting that mud material. Our alfalfa uh, leaf cutter bees or just leaf cutter bees will collect plant material and kind of roll up that area, um, that line, that stem kind of like you would picture kind of like a cigar wrapping almost. 
And you know these bees are around if you see these perfectly cut circles in um, your plants. I often see it, this is on red bud here, but you'll often see it on things like holly and plants with waxy leaves. Um, and then there's a whole other group that will use um, resin or sawdust or plant hairs, not pictured here. It takes a long time to provision a nest when you're a single female uh, bee, right? So um, this is an example of our osmia bees or our mason bees, often called blue orchard bees. So here you see that cross section again. You see those uh, little nurseries or those compartments with the pollen and the egg on them divided by these um, mud or mason type walls, hence the name. And here's the pupa at the bottom here. Uh, to provision one of these cells, mom must go on about 15 to 40 trips to the local floral mart. When she's there, she picks up, uh, she visits about 75 flowers per trip, right? And then repeats this to provision those five to 15 cells plus collects the mud for the walls. So. 15 at the low end times 75 times five, that's a lot of trips, right? And so if something happens to this female in transit, that's the end of the next generation, right? That nesting for that female ends there. Whereas honeybees have a lot of workers and they keep producing throughout the season. So our native bees really need these protective nest sites. This is what that solitary bee life cycle looks like. We have this um, single female building that nest, provisioning it with pollen, making lots and lots of trips back and forth. This is a ground nesting example. Again, developing through these different uh, larval stages, pupating and emerging the next year. All right. So we learned a little bit about recognizing different bees. Um, we learned about some of the threats and some of their habitat needs very generally. And so now, whether you're working in the backyard or the back 40, pollinator habitat must provide, and this is basic uh, science, right? <laughs> Food, shelter, and protection. Um, and I'm gonna show you what these might look like. Um, so when we look at plants, uh, this is the ideal way to do things, right? We want to focus on native perennial plants. We want to focus on permanent habitat plantings rather than annual flower gardens where those plants, those stems, that soil is repeatedly disturbed. Yes, those annual flower gardens may provide nectar and pollen, but like I said earlier, we have to be sure that we're helping these animals complete their life cycle and nesting is often overlooked. Um, through our research with land grant universities, we have tons of lists of these high value pollinator plants. So they're not all created equal. When we select plants, we wanna do a succession of bloom periods. So we want things flowering early in the season, middle and late. Of course, um, you know, we wanna match these, there's tons of wonderful plants out there that I'd love to have in my garden. Um, however, maybe some of them are only found in wetlands or very, um, very particular habitats. So we wanna make sure that these are appropriate for our sites. Uh, we're building habitat here. So, uh, you know, I know I'm using the word gardening a lot, but traditionally gardening has been kind of finicky, finic <laughs> I can't say that word, uh, tending to individual plants. Here we want to look at this as a whole system, right? Habitat. And of course, the availability and costs. You may say, Kelly, I looked at your plant list online and I know plant species X, Y, and Z attracts the most bees in my yard or my community garden and it's not listed. It could be something very costly or something that's not widely available. So we wanna make this easy for people as well. And of course, pesticide free seed or plants is extremely important. Here's just a, a visualization of that season long bloom. So right now we have a lot of early blooming uh, trees and shrubs that are critically important. 
in the summer. We have a lot of legumes, um, wildflowers that fill that middle range of the season gap, things like baptisia and lupin and milkweed. Um, we even have native thistles that are very, very valuable that kind of have been, <laughs> uh, have a bad rep because of our um, non-native invasive thistles. And of course in the fall, goldenrod and asters are those premier pollinator plants. Uh, very, very critical in our landscape. Very important for bees getting uh, ready to overwinter like the bumblebee queen and also honeybees. So I'm just going to go through and uh, name a couple of my favorite plants. So willow, maple, serviceberry, redbud, our spring forest ephemerals, even dandelions and clover, if needed, can fill some of these gaps. Like I said, we do want to stick to those native plants, but if you have them in your yard, maybe keep them. Um, summer monarda and coneflower and milkweed, our native roses, button bush if you have a uh, wetter site, and then some of our naturalized species that can be used on farms or as cover crops in gardens as well. And I already talked about goldenrod and aster, so I will move on from that. Of course, we want to include butterfly host plants, so our milkweeds. Um, I think grasses and sedges, especially our native grasses and sedges, get overlooked. Um, they provide shelter. They provide those nesting sites. They provide structure to habitat. Um, some of you that might have planted a native plant garden, uh, whether for wildlife in general or for pollinators, might have noticed that some of our native uh, wildflower plants are tall and stemmy and they tend to flop over. Our robust bunch grasses really give that planting some structure and kind of hold everything up. And there are the host plants um, to some of our butterflies, like our skippers. So here's um, a, a slide and I'll try to uh, speed up a little bit here because I know I'm getting to the end of time. But here are some of our uh, plants that you typically see at a typical garden center. And you may like these plants for other reasons, these ornamental plants. Um, maybe you like them for their aesthetics, maybe because they're easy to care for or grow. Um, and these can look pretty. It, uh, I, I'm not fond of them, I'll tell you the truth, but um, they don't have much habitat value. So you could plant them, but I often get calls from people saying, I planted all these flowers and, and you know, I don't see any insects in my garden. And that's because maybe they're just not a good, um, a good species or they've been, um, you know, cultivated for different reasons or gone through the breeding process for different reasons. And now um, some of those aesthetic things that were looked, those aesthetic qualities that, are important in gardens, things like double petals, um, have taken the place of anthers, or the plants have little or no pollen, or the shape of the flower has changed to such an extent that, that those food resources are just in, inaccessible. Um, and so here's one example of that. Um, uh, you know, when we're talking about bees in particular, they see differently than we do. And you can see here, here's examples of how we see, you know, typical dandelion here, and how bees see. And they see in that ultraviolet spectrum. And what these lines here are called are nectar guides. And what that does is kind of advertises to the bee, hey, here's where to come and get the resource. It's kind of like um, a landing platform for them. Some of our cultivated varieties that have uh, are selected for showier flowers or different aesthetics or flower shapes may have lost those nectar guides. Again, those nesting sites and pupation and overwintering sites for bees, butterflies, and moths are critical. And these can be things like brush piles and rock piles, the messy part of your garden or yard, or that area in the back, maybe where you can build this along the fence line or forest edge. Um, a lot of times we're thinking of 
you know, meadows as the premier, premier pollinator habitat, but hedgerows and forest edges play a really critical ro ro role, excuse me, <laughs> in pollinator habitat. Not only do they have these uh, flowering trees and shrubs which concentrate all those flowers in, in, in close proximity compared to single stemmed plants, but also provide those shrubby brushy areas for nesting. Avoiding things in the garden like plastic mulch, heavy layers of wood, uh, tillage, or a heavy um, uh, rocks or other cover, ground cover, can be prohibitive to ground nesting. Um, it's hard to create these holes and invite them, the bees to move in. I wish that would be the case. So recognizing them and protecting them is the first line of defense here. And leaving your stems standing in the garden. We've all heard a lot about this. Leave the leaves, leave the stems. Butterflies attach themselves in different life forms. Um, adult egg, pupa, uh, chrysalis, and overwinter on attached to stems. We have those bees that are in the stems nesting um, and other structural elements that leaving these stems are, are very um, important for as far as wildlife goes. So here's an example of those, you know, here's that, um, that log that's, you know, a, in um, decomposing a little bit and having these soft areas for bees like this um, screen sweat bee who does things a little bit differently to move into. There's these shrubby areas with mulch, uh, natural mulching where beetles and other beneficial insects live. And of course, thinking about what these, um, places look like in the winter. Uh, Becky, I have a couple more slides. Are we good to keep going? I am having a fabulous time watching. Oh, great. <laughs> and I guess the great thing about being online, if somebody has something to do, a place to go, place to be, they yep. can certainly go. Um, and, and I'll stick with you to the end. So yeah, take your time. Well, in the next part, we're going to um, just look at examples of what these habitats can look like, uh, where they can go in the landscape, and just some, some beautiful flowers, which I think everybody should be pretty keen to. <laughs> just to remind folks, um, don't be nervous if you have to leave. Um, it yep. is being recorded, and you can certainly, uh, you'll be able to log in our website later on and, and check it out. And I see that it, we're still good. The recording button is blinking, so. <laughs> um, so creating these pollinator friendly landscapes is what I am spending most of my time on and, and I think a lot about. And there's so many ways to do this, right? And if you think about pollinators and how widespread they are, um, you know, they really need this landscape scale conservation. And so most of my work is on farms or agricultural land, uh, but we could think about this at a bigger scale and we really need to because we're losing even the amount of farmland we can devote to these habitats. Um, so only three to 5% of the American landscape is undisturbed habitat for plants and animals. Uh, unless we modify these places, and it has to be where we live, where we work, where we play, where we farm, um, you know, we can't depend on nature sanctuaries alone or we will lose this biodiversity. Um, so taking this really new, um, maybe not new, but a little bit more progressive look at how we're landscaping and getting away from those old traditions of lawn and exotic shrubs and specimen <laughs> plants. Um, so here's some examples of the larger habitats we're working on in um, farmlands. People are very much drawn to these wildflower meadows and you can see why they're gorgeous, but they take um, a lot of time to establish and manage, especially if the starting conditions are, are unfavorable, like if we are converting a very weedy area or an, a plot of land that has been unmanaged and now is invaded by invasive species. You could imagine how long it takes to eradicate those to get these native habitats established. Um, but we have a lot, we've done lots of work on this. We've 
uh, learned a lot from our mistakes. So you can find our meadow installation guides online. And these are uh, projects that Xerces does uh, provide direct support for. So if, you're, if you have questions on any of that, let me know. I'm assuming most of the people online are working probably in smaller garden types of um, areas. So along with meadows, think about, which are harder, think about things like hedgerow planting. Trees and shrubs, native trees and shrubs are really valuable, um, even though that meadow has lots of eye candy and it's kind of what the people tend to gravitate to, it could be um, difficult for people. They may not have the proper equipment. They may not have the resources. Planting trees and shrubs can be a little bit easier, right? Less tools, less equipment needed. So think about that. And if you're, um, if you don't have a lot of space, if you don't have an acre to devote to a meadow, think about those linear areas that you might be working in, whether it's along your driveway at home or whether you want to create a hedgerow to block out your nosy neighbors or other noises. You could build habitat up. You don't always have to build habitat out, right? So thinking about how you're layering these plants, you know, something like this picture here where you have not only that um, tree line of canopy trees, but you have these understory species, the shrub layer, then you have an herbaceous and grassy layer down here. You're adding so much habitat value in a small space by building up. Um, and I, I just can't promote these enough. I think these multi-story hedgerows and windbreaks are going to be much more sustainable, much more resilient as time goes on. And they are so beautiful as well. Roadsides, we're doing a lot of work in roadsides. Um, and there are educational programs in New Jersey. If you haven't um, heard of it, if you look up the South Jersey uh, Transportation Authority Ready program, they are working with um, students, not only with pollinator habitat type projects, but other wildlife friendly projects on roadsides and in classrooms. Just wonderful. But again, you don't need these build big spaces. You don't need to have a farm or a huge plot of land. We could build these small gardens anywhere which makes pollinator conservation really cool, right? Because we all can do it. We might not all have the space to conserve polar bears or the climate. Maybe today <laughs> it might seem like it, but um, you know, these bigger species, grasslands, nesting bird species that need, you know, large acreages to build a nest, that might be prohibitive to a lot of us um, working in small landscapes, but you don't need large acreage to make a difference for pollinators. Small spaces are great and you can, you know, observe how things change over time. Uh, this is a little rain garden they planted recently in my hometown right in front of our community building. You'll see here that they included some wood features, some signage, which is always great when people walk by and wonder what's happening there? Why does it look so ripped up and unkept? Well, this is a garden in establishment phase. So we're waiting until all those um, seedlings establish. When we're talking about big spaces or small spaces, there are a few um, guidelines that might be a little different than larger meadows, right? Um, usually we're seeding those larger meadows and as that meadow matures, species will move around and clump in their favorable micro uh, climates or micro habitats. So you might see the species that like wetter areas move down slope compared to things that like dry areas clump up slope. Um, that can be done a little bit artificially or at least enhanced in a, a garden scenario where you're using fewer species maybe but you're having these big visually attractive clumps that may draw pollinators in. So in a small space, two to five species of flowering plants, this is just general guidelines, you could put more in. Uh, what we're not going for is just one of every of our favorite species, because then you don't get that mass of flowers for that bee to go from flower to flower for that foraging efficiency. Uh, include those grasses and sedges, like I said earlier. 
um, gives it a lot of nice structure, very, very uh, beneficial to our skippers and other um, insects that use that for cover. Using locally sourced open pollinated seed grown plants, that is a mouthful. Uh, what that means is some of our cloned plants don't offer resources bees need. So try to go for those straight species. Converting lawn, I know we all have heard about this. Um, <laughs> and maybe too, uh, I don't want to exhaust that uh, idea. But we have over 40 mi million acres of lawn in the US. Technically, that's the single largest irrigated crop in the country. And it has about the habitat value of a parking lot, right? Um, and that gives us a really just humongous opportunity to make improvements, not just for pollinators, but beneficial insects, songbirds, and a huge diversity of other species. And again, it doesn't have to be two acres of, of grass. You could have a small um, property like this with a small front yard where you have some vines growing along the house here. You have a little patch of grass. You have a combination of those wonderful uh, shrubby and herbaceous plants. A lot could happen in a small space. Here's some other examples. You know, this is uh, the example on the left you see with the clone flower and the butterfly and the bumblebee. This is just a tiny, tiny patch along a sidewalk, along a stoop, right? And just at the one point in time there, you have two insects visiting and I'm sure much, much more life and activity that wasn't captured. Planters, big planters. I know this uh, picture here on the, the right side has some non-native plants. That's fine. There's a little couple of vegetables or some sunflowers growing, but planting in, in big pots and planters is an option as well. Having a more formal design where you have these plants labeled and you're treating it as a learning garden or a demonstration garden is wonderful. Um, maybe something, and this is a little more formal looking, but it still has all those native plants. So it doesn't have to be messy. Um, here's a wildlife garden here. It seems that if you use any kind of edging, like you see these logs here, which also provide some nesting space and other habitat, other structure, um, using that or rocks or bricks to make an edge uh, will in most cases, stop people from complaining who don't know any better and thinking that, you know, somebody's just not taking care of their yard, all of a sudden it's done purposefully. Native plant landscapes, they can be very beautiful. Um, this is a small patch of <laughs> uh, native plants right outside a uh, PJ Willihan's restaurant, full of activity. Here's just a tiny piece of our parking lot in my office that was devoted to a rain garden, uh, an early establishment, so not a lot of flowers last year. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been there in about a month to check on it. <laughs> so who knows what's going on now? It's probably very wild. Uh, these, these smaller meadow plantings or pocket meadows are very nice as well. Again, fewer plant species maybe than you can, uh, would be accommodated in these small species than those larger meadows I showed you, but you can still get that um, range of bloom by using five or six different species. Tiny office gardens, this is a monarch way station leaving the leaves, that thin layer for bees and butterflies um, and other in beneficial insects. Avoid shredding them and please avoid packing that perfectly biodegradable material up in a plastic bag and sending it to the dump. Millions of pounds of yard waste goes to the dump every year and it could really be beneficial. A lot of times even um, farmers are looking for leaves to use as mulch and gardeners alike. If you're interested in getting your community on board or your campus, please check out our Bee City and Bee Campus USA programs. I don't want to spend too much time on this, number one, because I'm not the lead on this program, so somebody else could be more helpful and I could point you in that direction. 
And number two, because we're running out of time, uh, but here's that take home message again, and I hinted at this earlier. Um, you know, conservation really embodies a whole range of, of sciences, technologies, engineering, math, and of course, art. I mean, some of these landscapes are very artistically designed. So again, biology, ecology, entomology, botany, and other environmental sciences. There's great interactive tools. I'm sure you all know about Jersey Friendly Yards. Um, I'm sure Becky has promoted that to you already. Um, using plant and animal uh, identification keys, dichotomous keys, identifying plants and animals is a lost art. And soon we're not gonna know, you know, uh, hopefully your students will know, but there's a lot of people out there that wanna do conservation and have no idea what's happening in their own backyard. Um, Architecture and design, environmental engineering, all the different technologies I already mentioned, monitoring and observation, collecting data on changes in response to changing these plant communities or building gardens, whether you're counting butterflies or bees or looking at other types of metrics, um, learning that data collection and analysis can be very important classroom activity. And of course, our community science programs, which you can learn more online and participate in real time. Um, and some of it's easy as taking pictures of uh, monarchs or bumblebees on flower and reporting that to us. So we can build that basis of historical data. So we know what hey, Kelly, doing. I think. Yeah, I think we lost you for a minute. Oh, can you hear me now? Huh. I am still here. Hmm. Um. How about now, Becky, can you hear me? I could see you talking. You're on mute. I okay. I've unmuted. I apologize. I'm not sure. Maybe it was my computer. Oh, okay. I don't know if other folks were having a difficulty as well. Well, so I was at the very last slide anyway. <laughs> it looks like, according to the chat, uh, everybody else was able to hear you. Okay, it was just my computer. Oh, okay. No problem. That, everyone. That's okay. That's okay. I wonder if it. Uh, I wonder if it's still recording. We'll figure it out, I guess. Um, with all that, I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you're able to take some of these ideas and integrate them into the classroom. Um, and if you have any questions, I could stick around to answer them now, or you could email me or visit our website. Great. Well, I want to take this opportunity, Kelly, to thank you so much for your uh, PowerPoint program today. It was not only informative, um, the pictures were just gorgeous, and I love your enthusiasm. Um, you obviously are passionate about pollinators, <laughs> and that's contagious. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we will uh, take a couple of questions. I think uh, I saw one up there. Uh, yes, somebody said, um, Laureen had asked, um, when you say small spaces for creating a native garden, do you mean a five by five area, a 10 by 10 area? Yeah, so uh, really any size area. I live in a very small apartment. I have oh, uh, less than five by five patch of grass that leads right out into a beautiful parking lot. Um, and I have my own planter there. And I have about three species in it. And there are, every time I go out, there's butterflies, there's bees, there's other things visiting. So it could be as small as, you know, one of those, uh, four foot or six foot planters or a 10 by 10 patch of grass. Great. So no patch is too small. No patch is too small. Even window planters. Mm -hmm. If you build it, they will come. If you build it, they will come. Great. Good. So a lot of thank yous. A lot of happy Earth Days from everyone. Happy uh, Earth Day, of course. <laughs> and um, so I'll just finish with um, some closing remarks for our um, Barnegat Bay Watershed Environmental Educators Roundtable. 
Um, thank you, Kelly, so much for being our keynote speaker this year. We really appreciate your uh, patience and uh, flexibility with going online with us and for setting this whole webinar up. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, and I also want to thank our Barnegat Bay Watershed partners who created and shared their lesson plans, which are located on our website. So that's www.soildistrict.org and go in the education tab and look for roundtable. Um, thank you very much to the Soil District board members and to our district director, Ms. Christine Rabe, uh, for all of your guidance and support as we transition our roundtable online this year and uh, as we continue to transition all of our education programs online for the time being. Um, and probably most importantly, I want to thank all of you, you meaning all of the educators who are here online with us today. Um, you are really uh, the front lines of educating our youth, our children, our community. Um, you model best practices um, and thank you for your stewardship. Um, and your dedication to the health of our planet. Um, so how about we make Earth Day every day? I think that's a great idea. Um, let's stay in touch. Please visit Ocean County Soil Conservation District's Facebook page and wishing you all a very, very happy Earth Day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Happy Earth Day to you. Great, so we'll be the last ones uh, to disconnect. So thanks everyone. Yep, I'm gonna stop there.